All right, so last week we started out talking about carboxylic acids, and we said that we already know a bunch of different ways to make them. Um, the first batch that we covered was all just review of chemistry from previous chapters. And then we talked about the new method presented in this chapter where you can make a Grignard reagent, have it react with CO2, and then protonate it. And this is a really useful method for adding one single carbon on and making that carbon a carboxylic acid. And then from there, we can reduce this carboxylic acid to an alcohol. We can do other things with that. Um, so it's a pretty novel technique. All right, so now what we want to do is look at reactions of carboxylic acids. And again, a lot of this is just going to be review, so bear with me. All right, so a few chapters ago, way back in second term, I showed you this reaction where we could take a carboxylic acid and change it to a primary alcohol. What reagent did we need? LAH in step one. And normally this is in excess, so I'll just write excess. What about step, step two? Yeah, just water typically. You can often show this as H3O plus, just dilute acid. It's fine with me either way. However, when we looked at this, we didn't really look at the mechanism. I showed you the mechanism for ketones, aldehydes, and esters, but we skipped carboxylic acids. So now let's look at the mechanism. The mechanism is fairly similar, but with a few twists. So we've got this carboxylic acid. We've got our aluminum hydride which has four hydrogen atoms and a negatively charged aluminum. And we're used to seeing the hydride from the aluminum hydride attack straight into the carbonyl. Problem is hydride is also a really good base. So what do you think happens? Just deprotonation. So in this one, first step will be deprotonation. Acid-base chemistry out competes nucleophilic addition. All right, so we're getting there. Got this negative charge, and now we've got a, whoop, our aluminum floating around. It's now neutral, and we bubbled off hydrogen gas, right? So that hydrogen gas is just going to escape solution. All right, this next step is a bit odd. If we think about this aluminum right here, what's unique about it? It's super duper reactive, but then the question is why? Empty p orbital, right? If we think about this aluminum, it's sp2 hybridized, which means it has an empty p orbital, which means it really, 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 really wants electrons. So in this case, it's going to be looking for electrons wherever it can. In this case, experimental evidence shows that the lone pair here on the carbonyl oxygen will attack in. And then this hydrogen at the same time will attack into that carbonyl carbon and then will kick up electrons to that oxygen. So really this entire hydride right here is going to be swapped off in this process. So now we've got an oxygen aluminum bond. And like we said, this hydride that was on our reducing agent has now shifted over to that CO double bond position. All right, so now we're on along the right track. The next step, this negative charge on this oxygen kicks down. And then this whole group right here is basically treated as one big leaving group. So when this happens, we form an aluminum-oxygen double bond. So if we're keeping track of all of our atoms now, we can still see this hydride that was added in in the first step, and we've made an aldehyde, right? However, it's really, really, really hard to stop at the aldehyde for these reactions because we have excess lithium-aluminum hydride. 
So if we have excess lithium aluminum hydride, we can immediately jump into the next reaction where our excess reagent will attack in, kick up electrons. So we're going to be moving this entire hydride group over. Now we have both of them attached on. And then in the last step, all we're going to do is protonate with some sort of weak acid. So that's step two. And we get to our primary alcohol. So you can tell it's a lot more complicated than the ones for aldehydes, ketones, and esters, which is why I believed he removed it from that chapter and put it in here. Otherwise, it's just one more additional thing to remember for that chapter. Make sense? All right. There's other reduction techniques, though, for carboxylic acids that are a heck of a lot better, in my opinion. Alright, so the alternate one that's used is to take a carboxylic acid and use a boring complex. So this is a reagent we saw way back with our hydroboration chapter, right? Cool thing with this is it will reduce carboxylic acids. But there's one even cooler thing about it is it only works with carboxylic acids. Not ketones, aldehydes, etc. So I'll kind of show you an example of this. Let's say we have this aromatic molecule with one portion that's a ketone, another portion that's a carboxylic acid. If we were to react this with our boring complex, the ketone over here would just stare at it. This is unreactive. It's not something we're used to. Normally we're used to thinking about ketones and aldehydes being more reactive. Um, alternatively, what if we wanted to reduce the ketone and not the carboxylic acid? So let's think about that. What was that? So NABH4. Okay, so what we could do is sodium borohydride. water and then chances are in the second step we'd really really want to make sure that this proton on our carboxylic acid was on so then we could add in a weak acid to ensure that it's protonated so this allows us a, a range of uh, reactivity when we're um, planning out our syntheses now it's kind of cool make sense all right so now we get to go way way back to first term and look at how we can use carboxylic acids as nucleophiles. All right, so let's consider the following. Let's say I have this carboxylic acid, and my goal is to eventually make an ester. Let's just call it a methyl ester. Is this going to be a very good nucleophile? What makes a good nucleophile, first of all? How do we define a nucleophile? 
It gives electrons to something else, right? So if it has a negative charge, great. That means it's got an abundance of electron density. If it has a pi bond, yeah, pretty good. It's got a pi bond to donate. Um, in this case, we don't have a negative charge. Probably not going to donate that pi bond. So we got to do something to make it more nucleophilic. Does anybody have an idea for how we can make it more nucleophilic? Deprotonate it, right? So what would be an appropriate cheap base that we could use to deprotonate this? Think back to Gen Chem. Um, sodium hydroxide. It's dirt cheap. So we'll treat this with sodium hydroxide. This is called a carboxylate. Salt basically just means deprotonated carboxylic acid. And at this point, now this is a decent nucleophile. It has a negative charge, but it's not a really, really, really good nucleophile. And why is that? Resonance, right? That negative charge is being shared across both oxygens. So while it is nucleophilic, it's not the greatest nucleophile available, which means we need a really good electrophile. And it's probably unlikely that that electrophile is going to be secondary, because secondary electrophiles need stronger nucleophiles to do that backside attack. So what we're going to consider is usually some sort of uh, primary electrophile or methyl electrophile. In this case, we know we're going to add on a CH3 group, so I'm just going to change this. And we can go ahead, attack the backside, kick off our leaving group through an SN2 reaction, and make our ester. But I did want to make a note of this, that this, oops, this group right here, must be a unhindered good electrophile. Meaning primary or methyl. All right, so you may be wondering, all right, in the synthesis project, we're trying to make a methyl ester. We're not doing it this way. Why? To make it harder for you. Yes, exactly. No. Um, <laughs> if we look at this reagent right here, this stuff is super nasty. This will do SN2 chemistry on your DNA. Um, you've got a bunch of lone pairs on your DNA, right? Nitrogen lone pairs. Those nitrogen lone pairs would love to react with methyl bromide. If they react with methyl bromide, that throws off gene regulation. And I didn't really want to give you cancer. So we were <laughs> avoiding this route as much as possible. Um, but it is uh, a route that is done in some um, settings. You just have to be very, very careful anytime you work with those reagents. Yep? Is this pretty much equivalent to like methylating your DNA? Exactly. So if you've taken biology, uh, DNA methylation is used for gene regulation. We don't want to just <laughs> mess with that whole process if we can avoid it. Um, that and it's really, really volatile too. That's one thing a lot of people don't appreciate is they're like, well, it's a liquid. I'll just not get it on my skin. It's like, no, you will breathe in the vapors and it will react with the tissue in your lungs. Um, so it's pretty nasty stuff. All right, now that I've scared you, <laughs> we can look into all the other reactions um, that we can do. But first, let's look at all the carboxylic acid derivatives. And like I said, um, he lumps these all into one chapter in the Klein textbook, um, for better or worse. So let's take a look at a generic carboxylic acid versus a generic carboxylic acid derivative. And I'm going to put in EWG. What does that stand for? Electron withdrawing group. All right. What's the oxidation state of that carbon? <laughs> I'm going to call it Mark Allen. What did he teach you? So let's think about it, right? Who's going to win all the electrons between this carbon and that oxygen? 
the oxygen. So it gets none of those. Same thing with that oxygen. That oxygen is going to steal all of them. It's going to share one electron between that carbon-carbon bond. Carbon normally wants four electrons. In this situation, it only has one. So what does that tell you? It would be positive three. Same thing over here. The oxidation state for anything that has some sort of electron withdrawing group coming off of it is positive three. Aldehydes and ketones don't really fall into this, right? Aldehydes and ketones have different oxidation states, so they have different reactivities because of that. So let's make a list of some carboxylic acid derivatives. These have similar chemistry, but not the exact same chemistry. So we'll start out with the most reactive. And X in this case is usually chlorine or bromine. I'll uh, show you a pod later with iodide. Um, that's a bit tricky, but for the most part, you only ever see chlorine and bromine on there. All right, what's the name of this functional group? Alkyl halide would be without the CO double bond, but close. Acyl halide, so it's acyl or acid halide. I normally refer to them as acid halides, but some people call them acyl halides. I'm fine with that either way. So these are super duper reactive. In fact, a lot of tear gases are made of acid halides. They'll react with the moisture in your lungs and in your eyes. So if you've ever been in an area where tear gas was sprayed, it's mighty uncomfortable. All right, next functional group. This time the whole electron withdrawing group is that chunk, right, versus this X chunk. What's this functional group called? It's not an ester. Anhydride. We covered this way back in first term, but we really haven't used them since. <laughs> All right. Then we'll get to the easier ones. All right, and this one, the electron withdrawing group is OR. What's this? Ester. Not an ether. A lot of people are tempted to call it an ether. We want to call it an ester. All right, or we can have the nitrogen analogs. It could be NH2, it could be NR2, it could be NHR. It doesn't really matter, just as long as the nitrogen's there. What's this called? Amide. And then the last one's a bit different. If we think about the oxidation state of this carbon, this carbon has an oxidation state also of positive 3, right? So this is also included in the same category. And if we think about what acted as the leaving group in our problem of the day, what was the leaving group? The nitrogen, right? So the nitrogen in this case essentially can eventually be kicked off through various means. This is called a nitrile. So all of these have that plus three oxidation state. The main thing to remember is that these get more reactive as we go up. And down here we have less reactive. Why do you think at the top the acid halides are more reactive than the bottom? I heard somebody say something about a leaving group. You see how I've circled everything in green? All kind of look like leaving groups. What makes a better leaving group a better leaving group? It's more stable on its own with a negative charge. Halides are super stable with negative charges, so they're super duper reactive. If we go down to the bottom with nitrogen, nitrogen with a negative charge, not so much. So that's another way of keeping track of all of these. So let's put a note in here. So it's the same trend as leaving groups. All right, so now we go into the fun nomenclature side. I, I hate the nomenclature, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 
We're gonna really stick to the super duper basics as far as nomenclature for these. Um, I'm not gonna push the fancy nomenclature. All right, so the easy thing to remember for acid halides is instead of changing it to an oic acid suffix, you change it to a YL bromide or a chloride, depending on what's attached, suffix. So I'll show you a couple of examples to compare. All right, so let's first name the acid on the left. What's this acid's name? So generically, we could call it a fatty acid, but let's be specific. Hexanoic acid, because it's got six carbons. So what we're going to do is take off the oic acid and swap it out for that YL. So over here, we would call this hexan oil chloride. These typically have really high priority, um, so any other substituents would be treated uniquely. So if you have an alcohol coming off somewhere else, I guess it wouldn't be compatible if you had an alcohol. But theoretically, if you did, um, we'd call it a hydroxy group, something like that. So those are pretty straightforward and easy. Let's try another one that's a little bit different. All right, let's do this next one. What's the name of the carboxylic acid? Not ethanoic acid. <laughs> People would roll your eyes if you asked for a bottle of ethanoic acid. Not formic, formic has only one carbon, this has two. Acetic acid. And if we look at this one, we don't have oic, we just have ic acid. So we're gonna swap that out. So this would just be acetyl chloride. So it's not perfect. Not always will you have a situation where it's oic acid. Oftentimes you just have to kind of default to what makes sense, especially with the non-IUPAC named ones. Make sense? All right, next one's way easier. We'll go down the list and do anhydrides. This one will blow your mind. Instead of oic acid, you just have anhydride. All right, so let's look at an example of this, and it does get a little bit confusing. So we just saw this one, right? This is acetic acid. Versus the anhydride equivalent, where it's basically two acetic acid units that are crammed together, right? Can you kind of see how we've got one acetic acid unit over here? mushed together with a second acetic acid over there. Both of those are acetic acid units. So this molecule would be called acetic anhydride. Pretty easy to remember, right? All right, this is a symmetric anhydride, so it's pretty easy to remember those, but let's take a look at what happens when they're not symmetric. All right, so let's say we have this carboxylic acid making up one half of the anhydride plus this one making the other. All right, before we do that, though, let's do the simple naming. What's the first carboxylic acid called? Benzoic acid. And then we've got acetic acid. All right, if we think about what the anhydride would look like, we know it's going to be one half benzoic acid. 
and then the other half is going to be acetic acid. So now we can kind of see that this half corresponds to that benzoic acid unit, right? And then this one's going to be the acetic acid unit kind of overlapping. What would go first, acetic or benzoic? Acetic. We follow the alphabet, right? <laughs> so this would be acetic, benzoic, and hydride. And there are spaces between all three words here. Does that make sense? I know it's kind of tedious. All right, we'll just power through. We'll go to esters next. All right, esters, I'll be honest, confused me when I was taking this class. So the main thing to remember is the first word that comes out in your name is always going to be the group attached to your oxygen. And then you have a space. So make sure it's not one big long word. And then you have blank with an A-T-E suffix. All right, so let's take a, a few of these examples. So do this one first. All right, so first thing I always look at is the group coming off of the oxygen. So we've got this group right here. That's just a standard ethyl group, right? And then what we want to do next is we want to ask ourselves what this would be called as a carboxylic acid salt, right? So you remember when I went back and we tried to make esters where we deprotonated our carboxylic acid and we said that was a carboxylate reacted with an alkyl halide to give us the ester? We're kind of doing the same thing in terms of naming here. All right, so let's break this apart and say, all right, Originally, this was acetic acid that lost its proton. All right, so this would be acetic acid. And then over here, this would be the acetate anion. So really, instead of having the ic acid for acetic acid, we're going to swap that out for the ATE to describe that as being formally a negatively charged oxygen. I know, super exciting stuff here. All right, so formal name for this, what would it be? Ethyl acetate. All right, let's do a harder one. What would this one be called? <laughs> exactly. This is your lab product, but let's figure out why it's named what it's named. So first word is always going to be the group attached to the oxygen. So we do methyl, we leave this space, and then we want to do the other part with an eight suffix, not an oic acid suffix. <coughs> Oops, I forgot my L. Meta nitro benzoate. So this would be the overall name for the product that we're making in lab, right? The most common thing that people mix up is they forget what goes first. Sometimes people accidentally put this green group first rather than the red group. Um, and that kind of throws the whole system out of whack. You want to start with the group coming off of oxygen first. All right, let's try a harder example.
So check with your neighbor and see if you got this one. Does anybody remember what the red group is called? It's not isopropyl. It's got one too many carbons to be a purple group. It could be isobutyl. So this would be isobutyl. Or if you ever get stuck and you can't remember all of these, remember there's a simple trick where you can just name it systematically, and you always want a number counting away from whatever you're looking at, right? So I would go one, two, three. Whoops, that doesn't look like a three. And we've got a methyl group, so you could call this two methylpropyl. Either one. Most people would say isobutyl just because it's shorter. All right, so now let's do the uh, naming convention. I'm going to stick with isobutyl. And what would go for the next word. Butan 08. So isobutyl butan 08. Or you could call it butyrate. Um, both are acceptable um, because it is the corresponding um, acid to butyric acid, which can be named using two different systems. All right, last one. We'll do amides and then call it a day. All right, again, this one's easy to remember. It just has an amide suffix. So we'll do easy ones and then go to harder ones. All right, so we've got acetic acid. So instead of the ic, acid or the oic acid, depending on the acid you're working with. You just add in an amide, all one word. So acetamide. Make sense? It's pretty easy that way, I think. All right, so that works really well for a lot of them, but let's do a few more. gets a little bit harder, right? Whoops, this should be on the right. We'll put the acid over here. So this is still acetic acid. But if we look at our product on the right hand side, it now has an additional methyl group added on. Just like with esters, we wanna name this first, right? So we wanna name the group coming off of the nitrogen first. And in this case, we want to indicate that it's coming off a nitrogen specifically. So what we do is write N-methyl first, and it needs to be a capital N to indicate that it's coming off a nitrogen. A lowercase n means unbranched, which is something different. So we do capital N-methyl, and then we do acetamide. All right, let's try one super duper last one. Yeah. Yep, all one word. Good question. All right, this one is going to have a different parent acid. And it's going to have two methyl groups. What's the parent acid called? Formic acid. So we know eventually we're going to toss off the ic and the acid and replace that with an amide. But this one actually has 
two groups attached to nitrogen, we need to indicate this twice. So in order to do that, we do n comma n, just like we do with our normal IUPAC naming where we number the number twice if we have two substituents coming off. So n comma n dimethyl form amide. So we've swapped off that ic acid for the amide. This is kind of a mouthful. It's a super duper common solvent. People will often just call this DMF, right? See how it has the D, the M, and the F? Um, most people just call it DMF because it's kind of a lot to write out otherwise. <laughs> All right, I think we'll stop with the naming because we're out of time. Tomorrow, um, when we come back in, we'll start looking at the reactivity a bit more.